Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. My name is Stephen Jast and I'm the president and founder of ROI, Research on Investment, and Gazelle AI. It's my pleasure to serve as your moderator for today's webinar entitled The Great Reset Part 2, Strategies and Data for Our Recovery. I'd like to take a quick moment to thank our panelists and the ROI and Gazelle AI teams for their hard work leading up to today's event. This is a 75-minute webinar featuring four amazing panelists who will each speak for approximately 15 minutes. Following all the presentations, we'll have a Q&A period. So with a little bit of luck, I'll be able to advance my slide. So bear with us. <laughs> this is technology. So Joanna, I can't seem to advance my slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. There I am. So um, please do post your questions in the chat feature that you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be made available to anyone who would like a copy. I'll share my email at the end of the webinar if anybody would like to get in touch with me with any questions or to ask for a copy of the webinar. I think in any case, we do a, a blast email broadcast to all the registrants with a copy of the webinar. So as we all know, the reopening of the economy is a crucial and complex issue involving a range of risks, uncertainties, difficult judgments, and trade-offs. The COVID crisis is going to fundamentally change how we conduct economic development. Our goal today is to highlight some of the key data points, tactics, and trends useful to building a foundation for our recovery. So let's set the table with some basic economic indicators. The global economy will shrink by 4.9% this year. In a baseline scenario, which assumes that the pandemic fades in the second half of 2020, the global economy is projected to grow by 5.8% in 2021. For the US alone, GDP will shrink by 8%, a revised number in 2020, returning to 4.7% growth next year. Estimates are that world trade will drop by 11% this year. Trade had already been slowing in 2019 before the pandemic due to trade tensions and weakening economic growth. Future trade performance will likely follow one of two scenarios. The first shows a sharp drop in trade, followed by a recovery starting in the second half of 2020 depicted by the gray line in the chart you're looking at now. The second is a more pessimistic scenario with a steeper initial decline and a more prolonged and incomplete recovery illustrated by the pink line. Under the optimistic scenario, the recovery will be strong enough to bring trade close to its pre-pandemic trend represented by the dotted yellow line, while the pessimistic scenario only envisages a partial recovery. From a national debt perspective, the two trillion and counting relief plans are expected to drive up debt sharply, especially as GDP shrinks. The federal debt to GDP ratio could rise to over 100% by the end of 2021, which would be the highest level ever, higher than post-World War II, potentially rising to 107% by 2025. The number of Americans filing for unemployment benefits came in at 1.31 million for the week ending July 4th, down, one point, down from 1.41 the prior week. This brings the total since March 21st to 50 million. From a jobs perspective, there are some positive signs. Continuing jobless claims decreased to 18 million in the week ending June 27th, from a peak of 25 million on May 9th. Unemployment rates dropped to 11.1% in June, down 2.2 points from May. The economy added 4.8 million non-farm jobs in June. The manufacturing sector added 356,000 new jobs, mostly in durable goods. And leisure and hospitality added 2.1 million new jobs, a sector that was decimated in the early goings of COVID. But let's be cautious as we move forward as we're certainly seeing some spikes in coronavirus transmission across different states across the US. From an FDI perspective, UNCTAD estimates that global FDI could decline by as much as 40% over the 2020, 
let me try that again, over the 2020-2021 period. Furthermore, in the first half of 2020, M&A activity, and including cross-border M&A, dropped by about 70%. So what's the formula that we're looking at as economic development practitioners in the midst of this COVID outbreak? Well, what we know are that companies are certainly investment weary, uh, we've seen a number of surveys that tell us that company leadership are really focusing on net income and revenue generation. We add this to what's known to be a reduction in investment in FDI, and that turns out to be the requirement for a revised EDO strategy, which we're going to explore today. Stakeholders know that capital investment and job creation results will be lower than expected this year. That's inevitable. The most important KPI, key performance indicator for EDOs, as far as I'm concerned, is the adjustment you're going to make in your strategy. And are you making that adjustment in an efficient and effective manner? That I believe is how most EDOs need to be judged uh, at this point moving forward. So some strategies to consider uh, as an economic development organization. Are your industry and geographic targets still viable? or have been decimated by COVID? Are you reassessing your budget and your funding? Are you keeping your stakeholders in the loop? Are you engaged in concerted BRNE activity? It's much more difficult to attract a company than it is to help one that's already in your jurisdiction. Are you revisiting your value proposition? Does it still make sense? Are you ensuring that your mix of marketing collaterals are adapted to today's reality? Are you strengthening cooperation with your partners? And are you reviewing the principles of disaster recovery, which we'll also take a closer look at today. So let me uh, introduce to you our speakers. Dr. Nadine Jezerich is VP of Analytics at ROI Research on Investment. Nadine is an expert and groundbreaking authority on regional benchmarking. Nadine received her PhD in economics from George Mason University and her master's in economics and business administration from the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. Nadine will, will review business dynamism and international trends since the onset of COVID. Kirsten McGregor is principal of Sajax Associates, an economic recovery consulting firm she founded. Kirsten has served as senior policy advisor on President Obama's Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force and as lead economic recovery coordinator for the US Virgin Island Hurricanes Irma and Maria recovery. These are amongst many other prestigious appointments that Kirsten has had. Kirsten graduated from Franklin and Marshall College and has a master of city and regional planning from the University of Pennsylvania with a concentration on economic development. Kirsten will review some of the building blocks of economic disaster recovery planning and strategy. Morgan Kraps. Morgan is a consultant with the boutique location advisory, Parker Poe Consulting. Morgan previously worked for a mid-sized law firm as an attorney in the economic development and international trade arenas. Prior to that, Morgan worked for the South Carolina Department of Commerce as a project manager in global business development and as a senior manager of international strategy and trade. Morgan obtained her undergraduate degree from Clemson University and her law degree from the University of South Carolina School of Law. Morgan is also a graduate of the Economic Development Institute at the University of Oklahoma. Morgan will review site selection trends since the onset of COVID. And Pilar Madrigal. Pilar is the head of investment promotion and aftercare at the Costa Rican Investment Promotion Agency. During her 21 year career with the agency, Pilar has been instrumental in leading international investment promotion efforts. In her current role, Pilar is responsible for developing strategies, activities, and programs to promote foreign direct investment into Costa Rica, as well as overseeing the long-term growth of the companies already established in the country. Pilar studied marketing at the Universidad Internacional de las Americas. Pilar will review how Costa Rica has effectively controlled transmission of COVID and maintained a steady flow of FDI since the onset of the pandemic. And on a side note, congratulations are in order as Costa Rica was invited to join the OECD as its 38th member this past May. So congratulations, uh, Pilar, and to everyone in Costa Rica. So without any further ado, 
Nadine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Steve. Um, so welcome, everybody. I'm uh, very happy that you could join us um, this afternoon. So from a macroeconomic perspective that Steve gave us, I, I want to bring it down a level and dig a bit more into the experience of industries and investments and our trading partners and where we go from here. I do think increasingly, you know, having watched the data and, 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 and the responses from the companies we've been talking to, that a lot of the disruptions we're seeing right now, they were a long time coming and we were just forced to accelerate them this year, you know, for example, with automation. But we, of course, we have seen major supply chain disruptions that were unprecedented in the first quarter of 2020. And we have seen a lot of, you know, structural changes in the way we work and both challenges and opportunities that arise out of the adoption of new technologies. But let's start with what businesses are still worried about globally. Um, in the last webinar, um, the Great Reset number one, so to say, um, we talked about the supply chain disruptions, the trends towards market consolidation and revenue losses and the lack of demand. Now, more recently, large corporations uh, globally uh, surveyed put a fear of the global recession at the top of their business concerns. And supply chain disruptions uh, were at that point at uh, the fifth place. It's really the lack of demand and the uncertainty of when it will pick up again and whether certain industries in certain regions will never recover. And that is really driving, I think, the business and investment decisions at this moment. With the June uh, 2020 employment numbers out in the US, uh, at least preliminary numbers, we of course seen uh, in the media the, the big announcements about the rebound in job numbers, especially for leisure and hospitality. But these were of course also numbers that reflected early June events and were before the large outbreaks uh, accelerated and regions unfortunately had to start to lock up again in the US. It also shows that there's a very mixed experience, uh, for example, in manufacturing um, that has seen overall some turnaround, at least in terms of not job numbers, but there's much more to that story than just looking at the sectoral uh, job numbers. ROI has conducted its own surveys of over uh, 300 uh, decision makers between March and May, asked them about the impact of the crisis and their outlook. And Overall, the least affected sectors seem to be in transportation and logistics, um, with mixed results for computer and electronics and energy and utilities. And the software and application sector was interesting because we surveyed a lot of smaller accelerating companies, and those have seen either their funding dry up or demand for their product halted, especially when they were serving the industrial market. However, over 90% of the companies we asked still expect to turn around within 2020. Healthcare and life sciences, I think, was also interesting because everybody assumes, um, spurred by the pandemic, that those uh, sectors have been doing overall well. But overall, you can see there's still very mixed results. So it's not a very clear-cut um, decision in terms of you know, pointing out sectors easily that are overall that have been doing well or have not been affected as much. When you take manufacturing apart, you can certainly also see a lot of different paths. Um, the Industrial Production Index measures real monthly output changes for U.S. facilities uh, relative to the base year of uh, 2012, so you know, a good, good amount after the last recession. It's another useful indicator to gauge uh, short-term changes in production, as well as how current monthly developments compare to the same month last year. Some industries have fared better due to higher demand created by the crisis or just being more robust, um, even compared to changes from the same month last year. So you have certain food sectors and plastics and computer and electronics, again, you know, still very aggregate sectors. And you see that um, the transportation equipment and furniture and textiles are trying to make their way back, but they still also have a long way to go in terms of output compared to um, May 2012, uh, 2019. The Institute for Supply Chain Management um, has more recent results from June. They, for example, show that new orders are in growth mode again. So when the index goes over 50, that's um, technically considered an expansion, but as you can see, just over 50. 
And the Thomas Net Manufacturing Index, uh, which tracks requests for supplier proposals and project planning inquiries and product investigations, has seen two months of slow recovery, um, but still not anywhere near the pre-crisis level. But there seems to be something going, going in the right direction, so to say. At the same time, you still see import and export orders um, that are still in contraction mode, although their decline has slowed down. Um, unfortunately, I expect the July results might not continue that trend with the recent uh, resurgence in cases and, and some areas having to shut down, at least in some states. So we'll see. There might be another kink in the curve, so to say. Through it all, we have certainly seen certain niche sectors have fared better than others. You have packaged food and data processing that have made it through the crisis and were even accelerated. But all this data really tells me, again, though, is there's no broad brush that you can easy class, easily classify whole sectors as growth sectors or more or less crisis resistant. Not that it was ever that straightforward before this crisis, but I think it has become even more complex. The data, in addition, uh, can't reveal whether certain types of businesses have fared better than others, whether it's um, you know, small versus large businesses, those exposed to international trade, um, or you know, depending on the diversity of their customer base. If you look, for example, at bankruptcies, the government programs here in the US seem to have had some impact on overall filings. But of course, those government programs will run out sooner or later. But the commercial chapter 11 filings, the ones needed for large employers to restructure the debt, are 43% compared to June last year. And for the first half of 2020, the total commercial Chapter 11 filings are up 26%. Why do these numbers matter? Well, even if companies are able to reorganize and, and come out of bankruptcy, it would be really difficult for them to find investors willing to pump more money in, into expansion projects, uh, especially if it's uncertain markets such as retail and travel. And this will impact major employers in many regions. It also highlights the importance of supporting new businesses and replenishing the economic base. Business applications with planned wages, um, you know, tracked by basically looking at new applications for employee identification numbers, tax numbers in the US, have seen some positive signs starting with June. Although, you know, the states have had, of course, very different experiences. An interesting measure as it represents businesses that typically come actually into being the following 12 to 18 months, or at least hope to be. And I think it's really crucial to track these numbers for your state and really understand the trends and challenges. Um, a one week snapshot of like this, of course, cannot tell a whole story. Regions that can support not just new businesses, but the growth of these businesses will certainly fare better in the recovery. After the last recession, this indicator has never really picked up again to pre-recession levels. And the businesses applying now for tax numbers also won't be eligible for assistance. So who will support them? And are we going to lose even more business dynamism out of this crisis, which would be really troublesome? And while a high share of white collar workers have certainly made it easier for some regions to get through the crisis, I think it's also about innovation. Um, an interesting assessment I came across from the Startup Genome Project, which typically tracks um, the development and the performances of startup ecosystems across the world. They have to put together a ranking of innovation hubs specifically related to the pandemic. The ranking considers the number and the type of innovations in each city and country and gave extra points for outstanding initiatives and policy initiatives, um, also from the private sector. And you can see what was interesting, it is not just the major healthcare hubs, but also, for example, smaller tech hubs that uh, stepped up, such as Austin, Texas, and rising tech and medical centers, such as Salt Lake City and even my, uh, my local Madison, Wisconsin. And I know we're still talking about reshoring, especially according to latest surveys in, in metals and personal protective equipment. But markets like China still present huge potential in the end. Um, not all manufacturing was offshore just because of cost savings. And we actually have seen an increase in offshoring of IT jobs. Indian companies have seen a huge surge in service inquiries, with more data processing and IT demand in the US than our job market, even in best of times, could serve well. Understanding those international supply chains 
matters no no matter what wind the blow the way the wind blows so to say in, in terms of supporting your local businesses the primary source of intermediate goods for u.s production the inputs that are further processed into final goods here are not just from china but primarily canada and mexico as well as several european countries and for industries that are highly export oriented such as pharmaceuticals and transportation equipment and corn and soybeans for that matter the collapse in global demand and the ongoing uncertainties about future global demand and trade policies has had a substantial impact on export revenue and explains some of the mixed industrial production uh, index results we saw earlier. Foreign direct investment, of course, has been substantially impacted as well, as uh, Steve noted earlier. Globally, services, for example, have seen a slump in both mergers and acquisitions, um, which is, uh, you know, you might not be able to see well. The right column chain shows you the average monthly change in the number of cross-border merger and acquisition events um, between January and April this year compared to last year. And um, the middle column shows you the average monthly change in greenfield investments in Q1 2020 compared to 2019. So you see that you know services have, have seen the slump in both. Manufacturing has been much more hit in terms of greenfield investments. And pharmaceuticals, basically, you know, even though considered a strategic sector, and one talked again and again in terms of the context of reshoring, has seen more of a switch to mergers and acquisitions as an expansion strategy during the crisis. Again, keeping these international trends in mind helps understand what pressures your industries are facing as well as where business outreach might have to take on a different strategy. Looking, for example, at one of our main trading partners, Canada. Uh, its industry at the start of the crisis saw a trade collapse by 40% to the US, and their own industrial production index tracking output changes. So, you know, of course, transportation equipment, but also some of its key export industries, such as aluminum and wood products, um, you know, collapsed by almost a quarter compared to April of the last year. Now, Canada expects to rebound in Q3, um, but it's also still battling with the collapse of the oil prices. So how fast they will start buying U.S. goods back to normal levels and invest in the U.S. will have to be seen, and especially with remaining uncertainties about the new trade agreements. And then we have Germany as another major trading partner. Again, you know, a lot of trade in transportation equipment and pharma. And the exports there to the U.S. have plummeted in April and May, down about 30% overall. And its production indices saw substantial month-to-month -month, um, declines between March and April, where you know when the pandemic there was already in full force. May, though, already showed some improvement. And early indicators for June, um, in their case, they're tracking the mileage of trucks um, with uh, of certain sizes, which are subject to toll charges, and they use it as a leading indicator of potential, um, you know, re resurgence in the industrial production and those mileage of trucks have come up uh, about 5% in June compared to May. Uh, of course, still down from the same month last year, but that seems to be some indication that they're on a, on a recovery path. So we do see with kind of the, the June numbers that in, there's certainly overall some upticks and we see some positive signs all around, but nobody can really comfortably predict how long the recovery will take and when we're really on a solid upward growth path. I think what has to be kept in mind that states and regions with industry mixes towards more robust sectors um, and also more diversified economy will have an easier time recovering. Um, we pay so much attention to our job numbers. Um, I think we also need to stay informed about those industries and companies that are not just more directly impacted by the crisis, but are you know have more uh, issues with having uh, availability to retained earnings and credit risk and we also need to track not just us businesses and industries but our main trading partners we have to know what is going on especially if you have a very internationally oriented uh, business community we need to keep an eye on closings and unemployment but also new business registrations and job advertisements uh, to make sure that these companies are supported and with all the talk about restructuring and automation, we have to put skill transferability and retraining at the forefront to stay competitive. The latest ThomasNet survey showed, for example, that industries that adopted more apprenticeship programs 
were overall less impacted by the lack of skilled labor available. So there's still a long road ahead and a lot more moving parts, including our slides, <laughs> compared to when it was just, uh, for example, the retail apocalypse that we worried about. And our next speakers will go into more detail on many of the points uh, I think I mentioned. And I'm handing the mic off to uh, Kirsten McGregor, I believe. Oh, no, I'm to Morgan Krebs. My apologies. There you go. <laughs> no worries. Um, well, thank you, Nadine. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, appreciate you taking time to be with us today. Um, as Steve said, we're going to start um, today from my portion of the presentation by talking about some of the new considerations that our client companies have um, been considering and looking at in 2020, um, followed by some new considerations coming into play for site selection practices and then end with some of the trends that we've been seeing um, as site selectors with the projects that we've been working on. Um, so first, um, talking about some of the new considerations for companies in 2020, which is a post-COVID world. Um, the first thing, obviously, that we've all been hearing a lot about is supply chains. Um, this has been one of the biggest buzz factors in this era. Um, as many of us have seen clients or existing industries dealing with supply shortages. Um, we're looking at everything from toilet paper to tier two automotive parts that have been um, seemingly in short supply. Um, as we all know, it's inherently riskier to produce a product in other countries and have to ship it across the world. Um, for every mile on a road or on a ship or on a rail car, there are things that can go wrong and there's increased ability for delays. Um, COVID has, pro has proven um, that changes or problems in other markets um, or other parts of the world can also affect a company's ability to get their required materials despite having normal operations in a separate part of the world. Um, we're seeing a ripple effect, so you can be looking at timeframes up to several months um, in some cases for seaport shipping, um, and the effects of having a slowdown in one part of a, a um, nation may even cause um, issues over a longer term um, for suppliers or customers in another part of the country. Um, this is going to result, um, as we all think, um, in increased localization. Um, what this may mean is that project sizes may be a little bit smaller, but it will decrease risk for a company to have a greater number of facilities that may serve smaller areas or a single customer. Um, it also may create the ability to have increased amounts of product on hand and additional warehouse and distribution space um, in different parts of the country that can then serve um, again, a particular customer um, or particular parts of the market. Um, we are also getting a lot of questions and um, seeing a lot of buzz right now about tariffs and international relationships. Um, speaking about China, um, trade with China um, in many parts of the world can affect everything from widgets to agribusiness. Um, many countries around the world um, are seemingly losing trust in some of the relationships that they have in China and questioning some of these geopolitical relationships, um, including the United States, but also including other countries around the world, um, including India and Canada and others. Um, so this increases those risk factors that we talk about that companies are evaluating um, when they're considering where to grow their operations. But it, it moreover really creates some uncertainty with the stability that a location in China would provide. Um, some neighboring countries, so countries like Thailand and Vietnam, um, have been reaping and will continue to reap some of the benefits that are resulting from these tensions. Um, but many companies may opt to go to a more developed country where the consumer footprints are the greatest. Um, so this is going to create a higher cost for some of these companies. But again, it will decrease that risk and provide locations that have um, a, a seemingly more solid business infrastructure. Um, we've also seen bottlenecks in supply chains between the U.S. and Mexico, um, and this is sure to cause tension or cause questions, I guess, for, for many companies about whether or not having a localized supply chain in North America is sufficient or whether even more localization needs to occur. Um, as we look at the USMCA agreement that has just come into effect, um, many companies are going to be evaluating um, not just their localized um, activities in a particular country, but their North American activities as a whole, um, particularly in some of the sectors that have been most affected by the changes that have come about with the USMCA. 
Um, as we talk about immigration and visa restrictions, um, as a result of COVID, many nations are putting increased restrictions on both temporary and permanent visas as a result. Um, in the United States, these programs are restricting professional workers um, and intercompany transferees, um, which for many large companies who have um, rotational programs for executives that are, are bringing people in and out on an ongoing basis, this has potential to cause uh, very large issues for them as they look at their current and future workforce. Um, at best, we're probably looking at some delays in project timelines as executives might be unable to travel to other countries. Uh, but at worst, in some of the situations where countries may be competing against each other, um, some of these visa policies may play a role in project decisions. Um, if a company doesn't feel confident that they'll be able to get critical workers in and out of, of a particular country, um, it certainly has the ability to influence whether or not they ultimately decide to put an operation in that country. Um, so this will be something that we'll need to pay attention to moving forward. Um, next, we're starting to think more and more about um, digital infrastructure. So we're seeing companies ask themselves if they have the digital infrastructure in place to handle um, both a remote work environment, but also the increased data that's coming with these remote work environments. Um, so as we all know, we've seen um, decisions on corporate office structures changing, um, and many companies are starting to move to newer models. Um, we'll see some spending likely shift and um, spending that may have previously been done on um, real or personal property investments and office space and personal office properties um, may start to shift to investments in new technology infrastructure that will allow a better remote work environment. Um, in addition to this, we're seeing companies manage more data than they've ever had before. Um, so this is also causing companies to reevaluate their data storage solutions and make, de make decisions on um, data security and cybersecurity um, related to keeping all of this information that's now being transferred digitally um, safe and secure um, in today's new environment. Um, so we continue to hear that these data decisions aren't just geared towards your um, traditional um, you know, online marketplace, um, online companies, but also other types of companies that um, may not be what you traditionally think about when you think about companies that have requirements for data centers. So these are companies like manufacturers or other service providers that may have high volumes of um, sensitive client data or sensitive company data that they're looking to protect and looking to store over the longer term. Um, the next thing that we're seeing from a company standpoint is um, a greater concentration on ESG factors. So looking at environmental, social, and governance. Um, in recent months, we've seen that a lot of companies around the world are paying more attention to diversity uh, and they're realizing all of the benefits that having a diverse workforce environment can bring to their company. Um, some companies are also realizing the lack of diversity within their existing employee footprints and have either made or will make commitments related to diversity in future hiring um, and will be creating programs that will impact our future site selection and workforce um, labor market criteria. Um, looking at employee satisfaction, we've seen that many companies throughout this era have um, started to allow employees to work remotely on an um, indefinite basis. Um, so companies like Twitter and Square um, are creating jobs um, that, you know, previously would have been very highly sought after large scale office projects that now will have um, purely remote employees. Um, so this flexibility is kind of another new buzzword within the workforce that we're hearing a lot about. Um, and the trend is leaving employees or employers um, thinking about what their options are to provide additional flexibility for their employees. Um, so in an industry like ours within economic development, where we're typically looking for commitments from companies and we're measured based on numbers and, and announceable kind of black and white um, things, um, there are going to be some issues about how to bridge a company's need to have this additional flexibility and maintain a flexible work environment um, to attract and retain employees with a community's desire to recruit companies and measure the success of those companies um, where employees are not all sitting under one roof anymore. So that's going to be something um, that we'll have to figure out how to address in the future. Um, we've also seen a lot of employees speaking up about safety issues following COVID outbreaks. So as Nadine mentioned earlier, um, this will um, also make companies who have um, employees that may not have been previously um, working in a safe of a manufacturing environment or may not have um, very safe 
um, or very strict safety protocols, um, looking at potential trade-offs for additional automation and um, factoring in higher investments in automation up front that they'll be able to recoup the cost for faster than they would have maybe a year or two ago. Let's see, there we go. Um, so talking about some of the new considerations, thinking about these things as us for site selection. Um, our job is to make clients um, make educated and informed decisions, which are typically based on data. Um, so this won't change, but some of the things and ways that we look at information are changing in today's environment, um, both today as we sit here in an active pandemic and then in the future once we're out of the woods. Um, so one question that we'll be asking in the future is how has a prospective location handled the COVID crisis? Um, you know, were there special measures that were put in place to support businesses during COVID? And if the answer is yes, um, you know, what were those measures? Um, were there mandatory closures at the federal, state, or local level, um, or other state or local mandates related to the COVID pandemic that our company should something like this happen in the future? Um, looking at things like was the location um, that's under consideration flexible with their existing industries and what temporary measures did they put in place related to any incentives or clawbacks that a company may face based on temporary um, workforce reductions or other um, measures like that so you know what was essentially the community's treatment of its existing employers um, during the covid crisis um, as a whole, probably the biggest change that we've all already started to see as we sit here on a webinar, but that we'll continue to see is more virtual engagement. Um, as data and virtual resources continue to get stronger, um, we're replacing everything from meetings to site visits that were previously held in person to a more virtual environment. Um, in this regard, it's extremely important for communities to be able to tell their story in a compelling and comprehensive but succinct way. Um, so when I say comprehensive and succinct, that seems like those two things don't really go together. Uh, but when I talk about comprehensive, it's more important than ever to have due diligence completed and easily accessible, um, as well as strong data about your site, because sometimes the timelines for being able to get these things are longer in this type of environment. So we need to have that data available. Um, however, it's also important to be able to tell the story and articulate the advantages in a distinct way um, that gets to the point and gives us a summary of the, the relevant information that we need to be able to look at a site um, on a high level basis and gather the information. Um, so, you know, being able to do this in a digital format that's readily accessible is more important than ever. Um, you know, we talk a lot about will we get to a point that companies are making location decisions sight unseen? Um, I spoke to a company last week that mentioned that they purchased a building in India recently over the phone. So I think that there are some instances that this is happening, but I'd say based on most of the conversations I've had about this, um, the majority of companies still at some point will want to see a site or a building in person. Um, there's not really a replacement for getting out and spending time in a community to get a feel for it. So I think as we look at these virtual models, there will still be certain aspects of the site selection process that will need to take place in person at some point. Um, briefly talking about another challenge that we will be assessing and that will be difficult for us moving forward is workforce data, um, especially in the shorter term. Um, when we conduct labor analysis, um, we are looking at trends and figures that take place over typically a period of time. Um, a lot of them look at historical averages, um, some five-year averages and some four-quarter averages. So in this era, it's harder to get an accurate picture of what the workforce in a particular community actually looks like at the time that we're executing the project. Um, you know, shorter term figures are going to be thrown off given the higher unemployment numbers and layoffs. Um, historical figures may not be accurate given that there have been layoffs and other significant changes in the workforce. Um, so as um, economic developers, as you talk about available workforce, it's very, very important to be able to make a convincing argument that you have workers with skill sets that can translate and be easily trained to what a company is working for or, or you know, looking for um, and the skill sets that um, they will need for their future employees. Um, be prepared to show what types of programs you have in place to, facility, to facilitate um, employee skill set transitions. 
um, and how the community plans to help fill the workforce needed for a project based on the skill sets that are actually available for the unemployed workers. Um, talking about incentive programs, I'll, I'll skip back to getting new clients. Um, but touching on a couple of things, um, the first thing for incentive programs is clawbacks. Um, you know, hopefully the, com um, the companies and the communities had good attorneys as they um, did their initial incentive agreements, but clawbacks will become more of a business um, term that will be negotiated up front than kind of a boilerplate language um, and something that will be negotiated at the end of the deal. So be prepared to start talking about all of the clawbacks and all of the potential issues that come with those clawbacks earlier on in the process. Um, we'll also be looking at, were there any new financing or grant programs? And is this the type of pro project that those grant programs or financing programs were designed to help? Um, and on top of that, we'll look at, you know, how are remote employees being treated? Do they qualify as new jobs for incentive programs? And um, do those employees have to be on site in order to get incentive credits for them or are remote employees qualifying? Um, the last thing regarding incentives that we're getting questions on um, from probably at least half or more of our clients are, um, you know, are there risk of incentives being scaled back? And is this a bad time to be pursuing incentives because of decreased budgets? Um, how are state and local budgets being affected by COVID and how does this impact the incentive programs that are available? So um, it's very important as economic developers to be able to articulate um, what COVID means for your organization and for your state budget when it comes to providing incentives and tax rates, um, both presently and moving forward. Um, the last change I'll just um, briefly mention is that as consultants, we use many of the same mechanisms to find new clients as economic developers do. And so, um, you know, whether it's speaking at conferences or attending trade shows or company functions, we are also shifting our strategies to be able to, um, to find new business and identify new companies in this era. So um, last, just touching on a couple of project trends. Um, the first thing I'll say is that it's all relative. So. Um, Steve mentioned that we're a boutique consulting group. Um, so at any given time, we are working on a handful of projects. So what's true for us might not be true for another consulting firm and vice versa. Um, but I'll share some of the things that we've seen. Um, first, I'll say that our activities remain very strong. Um, we've had um, most of our existing projects continue. Um, and I think largely because a lot of those are in industries that are somewhat recession proof. So looking at food, recycling, renewable energy, and um, consumer products. Um, so we've also seen a few new projects come in. Um, largely, these projects were in motion before COVID-19, and COVID has not affected their plans. Um, but we've seen some that have materialized as a result of COVID. Um, so some companies that were shifting um, maybe what they had originally planned to do and now are doing something um, that is a result of COVID, but they're still um, remaining steadfast in their plans to expand. Um, going into March, we had a lot of projects that we were anticipating would begin in quarter two or quarter three of 2020. Um, on those, we've seen some delays, but the good news is that the delays um, that companies have shared with us are short term and not long term. Um, most of those projects have indicated that they plan to pick up by the end of the summer and the fall. Um, and I think the latest that I've heard of any of those projects saying that they'd like to start would be quarter one or quarter two of 2021. Um, it's not entirely rosy. We have seen some companies that have pumped the brakes. Um, we work with a lot of companies in the automotive industry, and we've definitely seen a slowdown in those um, as a lot of the OEMs are still trying to recover. And um, some estimates say that um, the automotive industry as a whole won't recover for the next 10 years. Um, however, I still think that even um, in the short term future, we'll continue to see automotive related projects that may not be traditional automotive projects, but um, particularly related to electric vehicles and some of the other new technologies um, we'll continue to, to still see. Um, so one trend, and, and this goes a little against what Nadine was saying, uh, but we've still continued to see um, even a more heightened interest in partnerships. And so 
um, where it's not feasible for companies to locate new facilities all around the world. They may be looking for partners um, and other companies that they could either merge with or acquire um, or form some type of a joint venture with. Um, for economic development organizations, if you have programs in place where you're able to identify existing industries interested in M&A or JVs, I think it will position you very well to be able to attract these opportunities, which often come with additional investment and job creation. Um, so I would encourage you to reach out to me if you um, if you are um, doing this or have programs in place, because we get these types of requests all the time. Um, and so looking at last what's ahead, um, you know, based on what we're seeing and hearing from clients, the, the few things that have popped up a lot recently are distribution, um, especially including cold storage, um, which is, you know, everything from groceries to pharmaceuticals and was on an upward trend before COVID, but is even more so now. Um, still looking at pharmaceuticals as well as PPE and medical devices and other critical products. Um, we've seen restrictions on exports from some of the markets that are, are um, largest in these industries. So I think we'll see a lot of localization in these. Um, we'll continue to see food and beverage. Um, and then of course, um, what we talked about earlier, data centers and cybersecurity. So whether that's related to the actual technology or whether that's related to data centers, I think we'll continue to see a lot of growth in this. So I'm happy to answer any questions after the presentation or by email at any time. Thank you, and I'll pass it off to Kirsten. Thanks so much. Um, and thanks everybody for taking the time um, this afternoon. Um, I, I see that we're kind of, Steve, how are we doing on time? I'm gonna maybe, Go through these a little quicker. Well, it's it's a 75 minute uh, webinar, so you know technically we still have another 25 minutes, so plenty of time for for you and Pilar. Uh, if folks need to leave the webinar, obviously um, you know you, you'll do what you need to do, but we'll continue on with the Q and A, irrespective of when the presentations end, and whoever can stick around, uh, we'll be happy to field any questions. So uh, Kirsten, take your time. You know we're good. Okay, great. Um, a lot, of, a lot of what I'm going to say uh, builds up on what um, builds on what Nadine and Morgan said. So um, unfortunately, this slide went ahead. But this graphic here is FEMA's graphic and how they look at recovery. And pandemics are actually considered um, a disaster when when they they have all these documents where they look at recovery and pandem pandemics are under this. So there there are different phases of recovery and and uh, right now we are in what's called the disruption phase. So with the lockdowns and with the reopening strategies that different states have and sometimes closing back up, um, that would be the disruption equivalent to like a hurricane or, or a forest fire. The response phase is when FEMA comes in and the Army Corps comes in to stabilize the area. Um, and, and that's why I say reopening is a response to, to the disruption. Um, what's different with COVID as opposed to natural disasters, um, it's been going on so long, of course, that the federal government had to respond with the CARES Act. So we have things going on simultaneously. Um, a lot of uh, communities throughout the country are, are, are obviously focused on, on reopening and, and this response mode. However, I think it's time for people to start thinking about recovery. Um, which is long term, which is several years. Are they interrelated? Absolutely. Let's see if the slide goes. So, long term recovery. Okay, what can you do with long term recovery as opposed to response? There, there's different different initiatives and events that you can do. You know, for procurement for for contractors. You know, small business for access to capital. And then you can start developing policies that um, that support businesses in the long term. Um, but but the big thing is is looking at long term strategic pl planning, and and, and we're going to look at this in a minute. But also developing strategies and plans that aren't just for you know the next year that that they go on for the next few years. Which leads me to I've worked in several disasters, and there's a few mistakes that are pretty common. And um, these are the top five I came up with. So, you know, I, agencies and nonprofits and economic development organizations and chambers 
they tend to work in silos and with recovery uh, you really need to make sure that you're you're as coordinated as possible uh, the other thing is it, it reference to the earlier slide recovery is not response i'm getting that a lot where people are are saying the reopening strategies for states um, that's that's their recovery plan and it's not so it takes a different approach a different skill set to to approach recovery and to approach response. Um, governance and oversight, a, a lot of areas, and quite frankly, most of the United States is not familiar with um, recovery as it relates to natural disasters. Places that are disaster prone have um, Office of Resilience or Disaster Recovery already in place. So having that oversight and structure that's as politically agnostic as possible is um, something that we recommend. And the capacity, and I'm already seeing this, I know many of the people on the call are seeing this, that the need for, for economic developers and the need for grant writers and so on and so forth, that's growing, but we see, we look at the budgets in the future and that's decreasing. So being um, pretty savvy with uh, the federal, all that federal funding that's available um, will suit you well. Um, Community vision, I think that that's another thing where leaders need to change their mindset with their community and really take this as an opportunity um, and change that vision of how you want your community to look and kind of builds on what we were saying in the in the previous um, two presentations. Um, how, so how do you build recovery capacity? Well, you know, there's so much philanthropic funding out there, but there's $2 trillion right now with the CARES Act. But there's, go there's also another round of another tranche of money being discussed in DC right now. And, you know, if you're focused, and if you're focused on reopening, which, which people do need to be, but there should be other people focused on recovery to take advantage of all the funding that is available. And when, when you do this, you need to be, you know, transparent. Like I said, it needs to be politically agnostic because if leaders change, that really screws things up if it's associated with a, a previous leader that had that left. Um, you know, and you'll need subject matter experts to come in. And whether people like on the on this presentation, we can come in and train your staff and, and so you can do it on your own. Um, and again, there needs to be dedicated interagency staff as as you know that all, all these issues, education, healthcare, they're all interrelated. Um, and because they're interrelated, they need to be coordinated. And um, the stakeholder engagement, of course, is, is key. So one of the first things you can do if you haven't already is work with a group like ROI and um, look at the quantitative data. And um, Nadine gave a, a great summary of what you would look at. Um, you also want to look at the qualitative data, and I know some of you, you you've done this where you've done surveys, you've done focus groups. That's important, but be mindful of survey and meeting fatigue, which because this is going to go on for a few years. So be be mindful how how you do this strategically. Um, also, all this information is pretty much required for for your grant applications, so it's important that you that you do this. Um, there's, and I think everybody's seen this that disasters have a tendency to highlight pre-existing vulnerabilities. Um, so if there's a food supply chain problem, if there's um, social justice problems, if, you know, mental health, I mean, th there, whatever the issue is for your community, it just highlights it and essentially forces you to deal with it. And that goes back to, to leadership during recovery. And, I'm seeing in cer certain places, and Steve and I have talked about this, where there's certain communities where they're leaning in and they're embracing this, and there's others that aren't. So I think, you know, I came up with some high level things, um, but I've noticed that the leaders who've released control, because as, as we've all seen, things change on a regular basis, whether that's the rules for PPP, whether that's when the funding needs to be spent, um, you know, the unemployment regulations changed, things change all the time, apart from, you know, the, the testing and the, and the increased rates. So basically leaning in and embracing that uncertainty is important. And as a leader, you want to model that behavior because 
communities are really desperate for, for communication from their leaders, whether it's a business owner or a government leader, because they'll go for communication wherever they can get it, and it better be from someone who knows what they're talking about. And I think, you know, finally, again, these are high level things, but your mindset is your message. So for you as leaders, hopefully you have a support system yourself with, with your team and at home, um, because this is gonna go on for a long time and you, you need to make sure that you're keeping, you know, a positive vision for, for your community. So here are some tactical things. I mean, that was more, a mindset shift that I've noticed is lacking in some areas, but um, you can work on action plans where you can identify your top economic recovery concerns. Um, there's actually, you know, this is something that a lot of uh, FEMA plans do as well. Um, you know, you can work with your community to figure out the initiatives and policies that we were talking about earlier. But again, you wanna make sure that you're clear and coordinated with your messaging. Um, and, and you want to update your vision because what worked before, maybe you saw some problems, right? And that's not going to work anymore. Uh, and depending on what sort of uh, industries you have, um, based on some of the previous presentations, you're going to have to adjust. So that actually goes back. <laughs> this is getting a lot of federal attention. Um, the concept of plan alignment. So you'll have a, um, a FEMA mandated hazard mitigation plan, and, and a lot of you are familiar with US EDA's comprehensive economic development strategies. And there's workforce investment board plans with the US Department of Labor. And then there's land use plans that somehow work with EPA. I mean, there's so many different plans, and a lot of them are gonna be funded under the CARES Act or, or, or at, at incorporating resilience because of the CARES Act. And, none of them are talking to each other. So this is just something to keep in mind that our plans need to talk to. And this is, this is actually something really important that I could probably go on for an hour. Um, but I was asked to talk about um, um, reshoring and, and, and my work um, in the Caribbean and how that relates to, to the previous presentations and, and, and the next presentation. Um, so, Reshoring and nearshoring are the new terms um, used today, right? And I have heard a lot of talk about working with the islands in the Pacific and, and in the Caribbean um, territories mostly, but that's not just limited to America. Um, there's obviously uh, foreign countries in the Caribbean and, and South Pacific as well. Um, but, you know, Morgan talked a lot about this, so I don't want to go into too much of this, but, um, but looking again, making sure that the territories are looking at the government support and incentives and um, making sure that you have everything you need. And like I said, I, Morgan talked about this from the site selection perspective and it's related. So I won't go into too much there. But this is also relevant to the concept of ocean economy. And um, I know we talked about other industries, but these are industries that are specific, specifically related to ocean economy. And I mean, it's 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 a no-brainer. But um, having having um, regional plans and embracing this for the uh, you know coral restoration, um, ship shipbuilding, and various uh, diversification of tourism and recreation. All these things need to be looked at with an ocean economy, in addition to some of the onshoring and nearshoring that we've been talking about. And islands specifically, this this, this is internationally, um, that you know because of their locations, they're they're, they're remote, and it's difficult. Um, for example, for food security, the things are, it's just difficult to get to sometimes. And um, these are things that are specific to islands. Um, and, and in the Caribbean, for example, Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands, they're competing with other countries more so than stateside where you're competing with other counties or other states. So there's definitely um, a highlight of leveraging resources and, and collaboration there. And again, there's an approach to the ocean economy and, and 
it, this is resilience with with islands is an international initiative going on um, through the United Nations. I mean, it's it's just a big issue um, that's being discussed. And 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 our previous panelists actually addressed a lot of these things with diversification of industries, making sure you have that talent pipeline, um, that you're you know you're mitigating with resilient ecosystems. I mean, so a lot of that um, we we talked about from a site selection standpoint and from a data standpoint, but it holds true for islands and ocean economy. If we're if we're looking at the concept of nearshoring and using our territories for that. So speaking of which, we'll move on to Costa Rica. Thank you. I just realized I was muted, but um, thank you very much. And um, for Steve to invite me to this uh, event, and I'm hoping that what I'm going to share is also useful for all of you economic development um, colleagues here and wherever you are. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, Costa Rica and how we have become a little bit more resilient um, to what's happening right now. I do want to take and make a disclaimer that as you all know, we don't know that we are in a, in a world of uncertainty, uh, but so far we've been uh, able to go through this pandemic in a, in a kind of resilient and seamless way. Uh, but it is not by coincidence. And they were talking about changes when government change and when ideology changes. Um, but the reality is that we've been building what we are now since very early on. Um, this is all based on a, on a vision uh, to become an export economy and to diversify our exports. So we really did work at the late 80s and the beginning of the 90s in to become more of, a, of an exporter of knowledge services and high value added products. So as you can see uh, here, um, as of 90, I would say the early 90s, we started exporting electronics, uh, telecom components, and we, we did want it to focus at that time in uh, uh, getting in close uh, of FDI from the United States. But as of um, the beginning, I would say, of, the, of 2000, we really moved up into thinking about two, um, an industry that was going to be resilient to any um, economic downturn. And at that point, we chose medical devices and, and high value added services. So as of today, uh, what you can see is that um, in terms of services, Today, we have become the leading IT hub in, in Latin America for digital tech. And we are the region's top exporter of knowledge services per capita uh, and the third IT services exporter in overall dollars. So um, you see here clearly, and this is excluding uh, tourism. So it's a sharp growth of uh, uh, knowledge intensive ser um, services that we are currently exporting to the world. Now, in high-tech med uh, devices, it uh, we have uh, we exported three point almost three point seven billion dollars in two thousand and nineteen, and it represented um, an increase of twelve point three percent compared to two thousand and eighteen. We are the second largest exporter of medical devices in Latin America, and we we also changed our strategy into bringing. Um, more again, high value added type of medtech uh, devices. So uh, disposables represented 43.2% uh, of the exports in 2001. And by the end of last year, um, uh, we had moved to for that same type of disposables to only, uh, I'm sorry, to represent 43.2 versus what it represented, which was 90% in 2001. Um, so what, what have we found uh, looking into strategy that has been built in the past decades that today we have a very solid environment for converging industries. 
Uh, we have 16 of the top 100 global tech companies. You can see some of them there, which have, uh, we em employ thousands of people in high value added services that they export globally. And we also have 12 of the top 30 medical device global companies. Um, other than that, we have, we, we hold 6% of the world's biodiversity. So this has been, um, this has been planned for the last 20 years. And it happens to be that in a, in a uh, pandemic like this, it has uh, helped us to be a little bit more resilient. Um, it is important, and I would like to make uh, a strong point that sustainability is key. We have been committed to sustainable development also for many years. 99% of electricity comes from renewable sources, 52% of our territory is covered by forests. Again, as I mentioned, 6.5%, uh, we hold 6.5% of the world's biodiversity. And in 2018, we, uh, it was 300 days in a row on 100, running on 100 clean energy. So that, that we have been very committed to. And what Morgan said in a little, in a little while ago is we have seen CEOs paying a lot more attention into ESGs. Not, um, they are looking for a combination of making um, an impact while being profitable. So we believe that this um, is a key factor in Costa Rica and have, has also, and will give us also um, a little bit of a headwind uh, with the strategies of CEOs changing into paying more attention to ESGs. So we believe that with this combination, again, IT, medtech and sustainability, uh, we, we will be able to, as of now, making that disclaimer, uh, drive our next wave of solutions for, for companies. So I wanted to share that uh, with you because um, Steve asked me to, to, uh, to say why, why we seem to be a little bit more resilient. And those are the, uh, the most important things. Now, having said that, what was our response, uh, both as a country and as an economic development and as an investment promotion agency, which is what we are? Um, the first thing is our quick reaction. So our first COVID case was reported on uh, March 6th. Uh, actually, that's incorrect. It's actually March 13th. By March 15th, the foreign trade, it was, the, we form a foreign trade executive table. Uh, several ministers uh, were involved and also members of 10 industry chambers. And they were divided into four main groups, immigration, talent management, logistic and free trade zone and sector assistance. And they would meet twice a week to really understand what was, what was the, the companies needed. On our side, what we did was as an investment promotion agency, we immediately uh, implemented daily meetings um, with the management team in which we discussed what were those responses. We reached out to over 325 multinational companies to understand what, what they needed, um, what was that response, what were they planning for recovery, um, and to also allow them to have real-time information. So we even uh, developed the Slack, which was a, a community in, in which all the national press releases were, um, were shared, uh, operational protocols, health protocols, and we also answered day-to-day -day questions to them. Um, so I, I do believe, and I have to say, I'm, I'm extremely um, proud to work at Cinde, both from a management perspective, but also from my team that really um, went overboard to reach out to these companies on a daily basis to find out what they needed. Um, what was the result? Within two weeks, 98% of the companies in the services industry we're working from a 100% working from home mode and fully operational. And from a manufacturing perspective, about 80% of them also implemented some work from home, 
particularly for management, but manufacturing continued to work. Um, there were no disruptions, exports and imports continue to work, um, and, and therefore um, very little, if any, disruptions uh, in manufacturing were reported. So that, um, what was re the result of that? Within a few weeks, um, as of March, actually, we've received and we've announced uh, eight new projects. Um, we still have a pipeline. I do, again, I do the disclaimer. I think this world pandemic will affect all of us. Uh, but so far, I believe we had a quick response. We had a, a strategy that was built over 20 years. And, uh, and, a, and a great team of people that, that work together um, on an everyday basis. So we did focus on health and business continuity. And uh, I hope this is something that helps uh, anybody as of today. And if we see second waves and, and they move into more um, uh, different structures in their, in their EDOs and IPAs, I hope this, this gives some sense of, of what you can do. So with that, um, thank you very much to everybody and to Steve and, and the rest of the team. Great. Thanks, Pilar. Um, okay. So we've pretty much hit almost on the nose. We have two minutes left in our 75-minute format. Um, we do have a number of interesting questions. So we can keep on going for another 15 minutes or so if the panelists are available. Obviously, if the folks listening in have to leave, uh, they'll do so. Um, I think that the, the most common question is, will we be sending a, a recorded version of this webinar out? So yes, we will, 100%. And if for some reason you do not get a copy of the webinar, please feel free to contact me. My email address is steve at gazelle.ai. Uh, or if you have any other questions um, outside of just uh, re receiving a, a copy of the webinar, I'd be happy to field them or of course, pass you on to the other panelists. Um, so I guess one of the first questions um, that was uh, for Morgan, um, what do you think will be the most challenging issue related to incentive programs post COVID? Sure. Um, I would I would say definitely the remote employee issue. Um, you know, that that is something that um, a lot of, um, A, a lot of companies are going to be looking at, and it's something that there's a lot of uncertainty around right now, especially, you know, thinking about a manufacturing company um, that may have some sort of office function. Um, you know, the, the vast majority of um, the manufacturing employees will likely be under one roof, but you may have a certain subset of, of even some of the higher paid employees that may have work from home options or may kind of split their time moving forward. Um, so how are those employees going to be treated? Will they qualify for incentives? Um, and you know what will either a state or a local community do as far as um, their treatment of those employees under their existing incentive programs? Um, a lot of those are statutory guidelines, and so we may even need to see some legislation about um, how these types of employees are treated and, you know, will they be required to live in a particular county or live in a particular state? Um, but that's a big question mark right now that we're certainly paying attention to, and I think companies will be paying attention to as well, and not just for office projects, but even for manufacturing projects. Okay, and here's a question for Nadine. Will the expansion of teleworking um, for tech workers help distribute innovation hubs away from congested coastal cities and help grow innovation hubs or diversify the economy in cities like Nashville, Louisville, and Indianapolis? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I do think there's a unique opportunity with, again, with the right with the right setup. I mean, you know, the the move. Uh, of, for to remote working uh, questions, of course, where did people go? I mean, a lot of people went back, you know, to to their, their home states or where they had family, um, not necessarily where they actually would want to live. So it still becomes a question of kind of a quality of life attractiveness and especially digital infrastructure. Um, so in terms of bigger cities, I think they can certainly uh, play the, the the card of quality of life and cost of living uh, specifically um, much more strongly than before. 
and I do think it belong um, and um, I do think it um, allows opportunities for smaller communities and especially um, you know even for more rural communities to uh, to have a chance to to catch some of that pie so to say if they have the right um, infrastructure to support structure to to support these kind of workers and you know the the right um, again the right the right uh, quality of life and amenities uh, that can keep those workers there. I do think there's a lot of great opportunities for communities uh, to come out of this. Okay, so let's so we decided before the webinar that we'd all turn our cameras on at the end so the folks can get a, a sense of what we look like sitting here behind our <laughs> our screens and, and microphones. So we'll do one more question and then I have an announcement that I'd like to make um, right after that question. So hopefully. The folks that are still around will, will stay tuned for that. So, um, Kirsten, a question for you. Can you please explain the difference between the US EDA CARES Act non-competitive funding versus competitive funding? Yeah, so I've gotten that a lot. Um, to get the money on the street, US EDA, um, understandably, um, uh, they sent out non-competitive uh, grant applications to vetted groups, meaning economic development districts, university centers, revolving loan funds. Um, if you aren't one of those vetted organizations that consistently works with USEDA, you were not part of that invited um, non-competitive funding. However, um, over half, my understanding is, um, no one's really saying it officially, but over half of the US EDA allocation from the CARES Act, and there's rumors that there may be more funding that they're talking about in DC right now, um, that there is competitive funding available for, for communities um, that, that did not get the um, non-competitive invitation. So I would encourage you though, to, to get your applications together quickly, um, because even though it's a lot of money, it's nationwide and uh, USEDA is a dis discretionary funding source, so it's competitive. Okay, thanks everybody. So thank you so much to all the panelists and for everybody who, who joined us this afternoon. I just wanna quickly mention that we already have our next webinar uh, lined up and ready to go. We're gonna be talking about uh, a very timely uh, subject, I think, so I'd invite you to put a placeholder in your agendas for what we're calling the Great Reset number three, where we're going to be addressing the racial divide in entrepreneurship and business opportunity, um, exploring the role of economic development professionals in addressing the disparity between the overall success of black and white owned businesses, entrepreneurship, and again, availability of support. We've lined up a, a tremendous stellar uh, group of speakers. We have Roderick Miller, the CEO of Invest Puerto Rico, uh, Eric Miller, the Senior Vice President of Business Development to the Greater Richmond Partnership, Henry Coxum, uh, who's a very well-known entrepreneur uh, in the New Orleans area, who also has played an important role in economic development on the board of, of NOLA. Uh, and we also have Adam Knapp, who is the President and CEO of the Baton Rouge Area Chamber. So that will be taking place on August 11th, uh, at one o'clock. So I'm sure you'll be receiving a barrage of emails from us to let you know that that event is taking place. And hopefully we'll see you all there. So once again, uh, Nadine, Kirsten, Morgan, uh, Pilar, thank you so, so much for participating today. It was a great session, uh, very informative. Thanks everybody at ROI and Gazelle for, for helping put the webinar on. And thank you to everybody who tuned in today. We hope that uh, it was a value to you and, and perhaps offered some ideas, solutions, uh, information that'll make your jobs a bit easier as we together try to make the most of a difficult situation. And again, uh, yes, the webinar has been recorded and you will be receiving it. And if for whatever reason you don't, steve at gazelle.ai. And also feel free to email me comments, suggestions, recommendations for future webinars. I'd love to hear back from you. So that concludes our webinar today. So everybody have a, a wonderful rest of your afternoon and a wonderful week and stay safe and look forward to seeing everybody somewhere down the path. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye.